morning, uh, everybody. Uh, this is our uh, last uh, lecture of the semester. Uh, and uh, I would like to show you how to take the final test. It will be in the same format as the first and second tests. Uh, I'll share the screen right away. <coughs> uh, uh, if we share the screen here, uh, you'll uh, see uh, your test published on the main web page, and uh, uh, you can access it at that link here, the final exam. And please uh, use the docx format and then send your test as an attachment to my personal email at magdiragheb at gmail.com. You'll also have another link that uh, you can, where you can access your final uh, test uh, in the uh, assignments uh, page. So if you go to the assignment page here, list of assignments, open the word format uh, version and uh, you will get the, uh, on Friday morning, <clears throat> you'll get the test. So let us just open this one and see what it looks like right now. Uh, you open Microsoft Word and you can edit uh, the file. So basically you can use the same file uh, that is transmitted to you. So you just say enable editing and uh, uh, you can in that case edit the, uh, the, the link. Uh, you can access it also here <clears throat> from the assignment uh, page, NPRE summer final exam. So uh, please uh, follow the directives to make it easier uh, on both yourselves and the grader. Uh, I'll uh, go back uh, here and I'll close the Word file. Hopefully it won't get us out of the system. Uh, what I would like uh, to cover today is uh, one important chapter uh, and it's listed under the Global Climatic Variation Change and Energy Use. Uh, we mentioned the hurdles or the filters that our technological civilization is facing. And we suggested that nuclear war uh, can be controlled. Uh, uh, we mentioned that also climatic uh, change can be to a certain extent controlled because it has two components. One component that has to do with natural phenomena that I'll try to describe today, but uh, by adding uh, gases and polluting our atmosphere, we have uh, something that we can control. And by all means, we cannot allow our environment to change to drastic events. So this is uh, what I would like uh, to cover today. Uh, just uh, try to cover uh, the topic uh, of climatic variation, uh, climatic change. It is not named anymore uh, climatic uh, uh, warming only because there are factors uh, that lead to cooling. For instance, uh, uh, pollution in the air that we have control on uh, can uh, decrease the temperature of the earth. Uh, it, uh, basically, it's a climatic change debate and how it relates to nuclear energy is a topic of interest and uh, uh, it, and we uh, can control at least the uh, parts that are contributed to climatic change by humans. So by all means, we have uh, to prevent changes and uh, uh, learn to adapt to the uh, climatic change that is caused by uh, <clears throat> uh, natural phenomena in general. Uh, so the climate of the earth has been known over uh, since the time of its creation uh, to be extremely dynamic. It changes. Uh, to our best knowledge, uh, the solar system was formed about 4.2 billion years ago uh, and the sun ignited. Uh, uh, warm periods have alternated with cold period. And that is in the fossil record. We have real information about how the temperature of the earth has varied over uh, time, over the last 4.2 a billion years uh, ago. Uh, the, uh, actually, it's 4.64 if you want to be more exact. Uh, but uh, the first period uh, was glaciation. It happens 2.3 billion years ago. Uh, 
during what's called the proteozoic period, and uh, oxygen started appearing in the atmosphere. <clears throat> the cryogenic glaciation lasted 200 million years over the period 850 to 630 million years ago. So the Earth uh, fluctu <clears throat> fluctuated through natural phenomena, primarily uh, uh, associated with our star, the sun, uh, over millions of years. So you could see here the temperature, the average temperature of uh, global, the average global temperature varied between 12 degrees Celsius and 22 degrees Celsius uh, over the last uh, million years in the past. So for instance, a different geologic period here, the Cambrian, during the Cambrian, uh, the temperature was high, 22 degrees Celsius, but uh, you find that it was cool in the pre-Cambrian period. And it fluctuated, that was 440 million years ago. You notice that it uh, went back to 22s and even peaked higher uh, in the Triassic period. That's the age of the dinosaur. It remained high and then came down again. It went up high. And uh, lo and behold, uh, uh, we are at a, a period of low temperature of uh, the Earth. This is now uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, within the last uh, uh, few, uh, this is a, a scale that goes over millions of years. So we have to accept uh, nature uh, varying between low temperatures and high temperatures and the range is uh, very significant, 10 degrees uh, uh, Celsius. Uh, this happened over millions of years and we have to look at the scale that is smaller uh, in uh, uh, resolution. Uh, the end of the glacial period happened on Earth uh, uh, right around 10,000 years ago. You could see here that uh, uh, these are the years before present. At 9 uh, uh, million uh, years before present, uh, the Earth started warming back again, as you could see. And uh, the, uh, it reached an optimal uh, average temperature of about, uh, let's say, 16 degrees Celsius at uh, what's called the Holocene climate optimum. This is the ideal temperature for uh, life on Earth to exist. And uh, it kept fluctuating uh, over the last few uh, thousand years. So this is now a scale that is not in the millions of years, but in the thousands of years. Uh, at some point, uh, very recently, there was a little ice age. I'll talk about it more. Uh, during the medieval times, it was warm enough, and uh, we are at a period where there is some warming of the Earth really occurring. And uh, uh, this is uh, natural. The humans did not exist. Uh, we didn't have any pollution from uh, fossil fuels at the time. So we can only think that these were caused by natural uh, uh, events. Uh, it is not that the Earth is not just subjected to global uh, warming. Uh, at some point, it can also be cooled. And uh, uh, the uh, reason for this, as I suggested, are beyond our control. And uh, uh, we have also not just a period of uh, cooling and warming that are caused by uh, the variation in the Earth in relation to our star, the sun, but there are also short-term cycles. So we fluctuate between the uh, oceanic kind of uh, uh, index. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's displayed here by uh, what's called El Nino and La Nina. That's in Spanish, El Nino, the baby, uh, and uh, La Nina, the, uh, the, the baby uh, girl, a baby boy here, El Nino. And it's an ev ev effect that happens uh, fluctuations in terms of the heating of the oceans by the sun and the transportation of the uh, heat from the sun by the ocean waters. You notice that it varies between periods of heat up, El Nino, and periods of La Nina. El Nino refers to baby Jesus because it happens off the coast of South America uh, around Christmas time. Uh, fishermen notice a change in the production of anchovies. And anchovies are used on a large scale to feed uh, uh, cattle. And uh, basically, they're also used as human food. La Nina is a period where the 
the southern uh, uh, ocean, the Pacific Ocean uh, west uh, our, uh, of the coast of South America, uh, you get La Nina. La Nina is a cooling of the ocean waters. When cooling occurs, uh, there is an uplift of nutrients from the bottom of the ocean and the catch of anchovies goes up. And, um, uh, and you find that it affects the weather phenomena in different parts of the world. In our case, uh, 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 we are in a La Nina period and you could see that there is some variation from the normal. We get all that flooding and all that rain in different parts of uh, the world. Uh, the, uh, as I suggested uh, that uh, these phenomena, either the long-term glaciation and warming and La Nina, El Nina, these are the short-term fluctuations, have to do with uh, the uh, geographical phenomena. Uh, one of them is definitely the tilt of the Earth. Uh, the Earth is rotating around its uh, north-south axis, but that axis is not vertical, totally vertical. It has an angle of 23 degrees, 23 and a half degrees to be exact. And uh, we know, of course, that the seasons are affected by the position or the location of the Earth uh, with its tilt relative to uh, the sun. So we get uh, two solstices. Uh, uh, when uh, the, 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 the sun radiation hits uh, either the, uh, uh, the, the lower latitude during the December, that would be the winter solstice, or uh, the spring. So we find that this is where the maximum heat from the Earth occurs. And uh, then we have two equinoxes, and in that case, the sun is directly above the equator as uh, uh, the uh, different locations on the sun, the upper hemisphere and the lower hemisphere get a different angle from the sun. So if the sun is uh, vertical at 90 degrees to the equator, you get the maximum heating in that case. Uh, the uh, equinoxes happen on March 21st and uh, September 22. Uh, we are getting into an equinox at that time, uh, the period of the uh, summer uh, changes into uh, the winter and uh, you get the solstice of the winter on December 21st and the solstice in the spring uh, on June 21st. So the effect of the earth definitely uh, changes the seasons here. You can say that it's effect from our stars, the sun, or you can say it's an effect from our uh, planet, uh, the earth. Uh, there are lots of other uh, short-term oscillations that we know of, the North Atlantic Oscillation, designated as NAO. And, uh, but uh, the most uh, interesting uh, knowledge about the variation of the temperature of the Earth comes from ice cores. And uh, ice cores have been taken uh, over uh, a long period of time. And uh, uh, the isotopes that uh, form in the ice are analyzed and uh, uh, geologists and paleontologists uh, can infer what was the temperature of the Earth over long periods of time. So we know, for instance, that was a, there was a solar cycle effect in uh, what was called the mini ice age from 1347 to 1351, uh, the uh, solar cycle reached a minimum and uh, the river Thames in the UK, for instance, is known to have uh, totally uh, uh, frozen. People would go there ice skating on the river Thames, which is now water. Uh, we know the information from also uh, different cores of uh, accumulations of ice over time. One of them is in Antarctica. It's called the Vostok, uh, right, uh, being run by the Russians. And uh, basically, they got a, a core in uh, the ice uh, of a height of 2.2 miles. And they discovered something interesting that under the ice uh, in Antarctica, they have uh, running water, a lake. They call it Fostok, Lake Fostok there. And they found, fascinatingly enough, uh, different forms of life that are, do not exist on the surface of the Earth that have evolved uh, over uh, millions of years. So, uh, this uh, is uh, information that we got that I simply uh, drilled the, the core by melting the ice and getting samples and analyzing them uh, in general. So we have really scientific information about it. 
and uh, you can access the data uh, about the temperatures uh, from the past talk. Uh, and they have also uh, some uh, samples that come in from ice cores in Iceland. And uh, uh, you can access them. I give, you, I give you a way of accessing them and testing uh, what I'm showing you here. So I went to that database and I put it into uh, uh, Excel uh, and I plotted the temperature variation uh, of the Earth uh, that shows the age uh, in years before present. Present would be here and uh, up to some uh, 425,000 years ago. So this is actual data. And you could see here that the temperature variation in degrees Celsius uh, reached uh, here two degrees Celsius as a maximum 425,000 years ago. And then uh, something interesting uh, happens uh, in, uh, this is a graph I generated myself. You find that the temperature decreases to minus eight below the average and then jumps back again to two degrees above average. And then comes back again and jumps uh, with a cycle of about 100,000 years. You could see here from 425, that's uh, 325. A uh, 100,000 year cycle definitely is evident here. And uh, 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 we are at one of those peaks right now. So people are, are on that basis predicting a possible cooling of the earth over that 100,000 year uh, period. Uh, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, if you put this uh, data like uh, was done here on uh, some kind of a, a, a a fit uh, for a straight line, you find that our Earth's temperature is decreasing very, very, very slowly. And some people say, oh, we are getting, uh, uh, the sun is getting weaker. That's the uh, uh, <clears throat> implication of it. And uh, uh, we are getting, the Earth is getting cooler over a period of, you see the period here, 100,000, 100,000, 100, approximately 100,000 uh, years. Now you can take the data here and look uh, at more uh, better resolution. So you can do that yourself uh, by getting the data. I give you the source in the references, uh, reference one and two. And uh, 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 this is data that is from central Greenland ice cores basically. And uh, I show here a, bet a different resolution over the last 50,000 years. So this is the age in thousands of years before present. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, the temperature in degrees Celsius variation. If you look at the temperature of the Earth over the last, uh, uh, say, uh, 50,000 years, uh, you'll find fluctuations also. Uh, but uh, if you put it on a, a linear uh, a fit scale, oh, it's not decreasing anymore like in the previous graph. Uh, you find that there is a, an increase in the temperature of the Earth. So that's over a scale of 50,000 years before present. Uh, uh, I give you the references for the Iceland uh, uh, variation here, uh, reference three and four. Now, while we are maybe interested in what's happening uh, closer to the present, not just in the last uh, 50,000 years, so we take the data and uh, change the scale. And uh, this is what we get in the last 5,000 years. So that is when human civilization has started. We start uh, learning about the civilization in India, China, Japan, uh, uh, Mesopotamia, the Middle East, uh, the Pharaonic uh, uh, and the Incas and so on. You find over 5,000 years, the temperature has been some kind of decreasing, but only over the last year, this is now a thousand years, in the last uh, uh, thousand years, uh, point one means, uh, now every uh, 200 years, the temperature has been increasing. And this is uh, associated with the presence of uh, humans. So definitely our stars, the sun, and the geological uh, phenomena affect the temperature of the earth, the so global warming, if you want to call it, or global cooling. But lately, the advent of humans have generated a very significant rise in the temperature of the earth. So we cannot ignore uh, the uh, effect of uh, humans uh, on the temperature of the earth. It may have been decreasing and uh, our civilization is increasing it. 
And uh, you know, of course, that uh, uh, the least squares linear interpolation shows about 0.2 degrees Celsius increase in the temperature. And uh, the, that uh, shape here that has happened uh, associated with humans uh, uh, industrial revolution and the burning of fossil fuels is called the hockey stick. So it looks like a hockey stick curve. If you read the literature, that's what they refer to as a hockey stick uh, curve. So definitely uh, humans are affecting the weather to a certain degree, even though the main changes uh, and fluctuations uh, are not under their control when it comes to uh, geological and uh, 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 phenomena in general. Uh, some gentleman uh, by the name of Milankovic uh, uh, studied these effects that are beyond the human uh, uh, control. And uh, he suggested that uh, we do have the Earth undergoes orbital cycles. Uh, he tried to suggest why is it that we have that 100,000 year cycle that I have just shown you uh, in data that are not really, cannot be challenged. These are real data, scientific data. This is Mr. Milankovic's, and uh, he suggested that uh, the Earth under, has different cycles related to its star, the sun. Uh, we mentioned the, the tilt of the Earth, of course, 23.5 degrees here, and uh, uh, this is the tilt or obliquity of the Earth. That changes over a period of time that basically uh, varies the temperature of the Earth because it sees uh, solar radiation at different angles. And not only that, but uh, there is uh, another effect due to E here. E basically is eccentricity of the orbit. When the orbit is too eccentric, uh, you find variations in the solar radiation affecting the Earth. And then we have another effect here, P, uh, that is the precession or change in the direction of the axis tilt at a given point in the orbit. So we have already three effects here. And depending on how the Earth is facing radiation from its star, the sun, uh, temperature on the Earth is also Effect. So it is not just a human's contribution, but definitely uh, uh, more contribution from phenomena that we have no control on. Uh, this uh, shows us really the fact that the Earth is acts like a top. If you rotate a top on top of a table, uh, this is what's called the precession. You could see that the position, because the Earth is not just rotating really, uh, around the vertical axis, there is a tilt here. And uh, that cycle affects the temperature variation in the Earth in the geological times uh, in a cycle of 25,920 years, according to the studies by Milankovic. Uh, there is also uh, another factor that comes from the eccentricity of the Earth. The Earth does not rotate around the sun in an exact circle. It uh, rotates uh, in the form of an ellipse. And uh, when it is closer to the sun, uh, that's called the perihelion in the ellipse uh, 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 kind of geometrical figure, uh, then of course, uh, the, the Earth is uh, receiving more solar radiation. So the temperature is expected to go up. Uh, a perihelion is uh, uh, in the eccentricity of the exagger exaggerated, obviously here, uh, a perihelion when a perihelion is one uh, the Earth is as far as possible from its star, the sun. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, that is not to scale at all. The Earth here is a very, very tiny little dot in space. Uh, that's uh, basically the sun is um, one million times the size of uh, the Earth. So the eccentricity here is exaggerated to suggest that there is an effect here that comes from geographical uh, fact. Uh, you notice also that the sun and the earth has two celestial bodies and they both rotate, but they do not rotate exactly around the same center. They rotate around the center of mass. So that is uh, the center of the sun uh, earth system. Uh, this is of center of mass of two bodies rotating around each other. So we have the gravitational attraction uh, from the sun to the earth over a distance of uh, 1.5, 10 to the eighth kilometer. And uh, the sun itself uh, is a very large body. It's uh, seven, 10 to the fifth kilometer in uh, radius. So uh, both of them rotate around the center of mass. 
and that also affect the weather variations in general. There are other climatic variation uh, changes that, uh, and uh, I call it the climatic variation because it is going to vary whether we like it or not. Uh, uh, when uh, humans uh, uh, affect it, uh, basically it's uh, from the release of methane, CH4, uh, CO2, and in fact, uh, water uh, moisture in the air are all potent greenhouse effects. And we know about the greenhouse effect uh, uh, that increases the temperature of the Earth by trapping radiation from the sun. Uh, scientists think that there is a major role uh, 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 that can be attributed to uh, atmospheric CO2, more so than, say, uh, the moisture in the air or uh, water vapor uh, in general. Uh, there is an effect that has to do with the solar energy output, and this has to do with the solar cycle. The solar cycle so the sun uh, uh, ebbs and webs in the energy it generates uh, over an 11 year cycle. And that was first observed by looking at the sun through a telescope by uh, Chinese astronomers a long time ago and uh, in 28 before Christ. And it was reported by Thomas Herriot shown here. And these are sunspots on the surface of the sun. Uh, if you, uh, uh, a, a fact that is not known to many people is that when you observe the sunspots on the surface of the sun, when the sun is active, they all happen in pairs. You notice here one and two, one and two, one and two, one and two, and one and two. And uh, there is an explanation for this uh, in a moment. Uh, also, uh, Galileo Galilei, remember he invented the uh, telescope, uh, observed the sun uh, uh, in 1609, uh, observed the sunspots. They happen again, you see, in pairs, 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 pairs. Very <laughs> not well known fact uh, to people. It has to do uh, with the magnetic field of uh, the sun. Uh, when the sun uh, has, it has a North Pole and a South Pole, obviously, uh, the corona or the outer part of the sun is undergoing fusion reaction. So all energies on Earth are related to that fusion energy in the sun. We uh, looked at the equations and the chain reactions in that case. But uh, uh, the surface of the sun is controlled by the sun magnetic field. And the activity in the corona uh, can uh, generate situations where the magnetic field lines are squeezed out of the surface of the sun. So if the magnetic field uh, is uh, squeezed out of the surface of the sun, it has to exit in one part and re-enter back again at another part. So in that case, solar uh, sunspots basically occur in pairs. One is a south pole of uh, uh, a magnetic field and one is a north pole. And you know that the charged particles, the electrons uh, move in one direction and the electrons will move in the opposite uh, direction. So uh, uh, we are right now at a minimum in the solar radiation and the magnetic field of the sun is weaker. So we are being bombarded by lots of cosmic radiation. We, in the last lecture, we talked about cosmic radiation and the cosmic radiation acts as a nucleation site. So it enhances the formation of clouds, which leads somehow to a little cooling. Uh, but at the same time, uh, cloud formation means more rain events. And uh, we hear about flooding in China, here in the United States and other parts of uh, the world. So this is a structure of sunspot occurring on the sun. And uh, we know, depending on the number of sunspots, how the sun is active. And it has to do with the magnetic field of the sun. Remember, it's a plasma. It uh, has uh, uh, charged particles, primarily protons, electrons. And uh, the rotation of it creates a magnetic field because you have a current. Uh, and the current creates a magnetic uh, field. Uh, uh, sometimes that those magnetic field lines stretch. And as they stretch, then as I suggested, uh, they can pull out from the surface of uh, the sun and uh, uh, re-enter back again. And that's what we see as the sunspot in the plane when you look at the sun uh, through a telescope. Uh, the interesting thing is that it has been observed that the sun magnetic field reverses every once in uh, while, uh, uh, in a while, when it has a minimum activity like now, that's the way it looks like. So uh, 
uh, when it has a maximum uh, activity, you get a very different uh, 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 shape of the magnetic field of the sun to the point that some of the material in the sun can be ejected and hit us, hit uh, the earth uh, in general. Uh, some people, of course, are studying this phenomena because of their association with weather on earth. Uh, most of the activity happens in the corona of the sun. You find that you generate currents, magnetic fields, and uh, uh, this lead to that 22 year cycle or half of it is 11 year cycle. There is also a cycle that happens every uh, two years, uh, but the solar uh, cycle is uh, really uh, 22 years uh, uh, when you have a, a total variation in general. So suggest, I suggested that cosmic rays uh, affect cloud formation. Uh, when, the Earth, when the magnetic field of the Earth or the activity on the sun is low, uh, the magnetic field is also low and cosmic radiation uh, reaches the Earth. So we get a larger amount of cosmic radiation at times where uh, the sun is uh, very active uh, and vice versa. And uh, this is a, a, scale, uh, uh, a, a plot that shows uh, the sunspot cycles here every uh, from one peak to another to the next peak, that's 22 years. And from one peak to the other, uh, it's 11 years. And you could see here the measurements of the cosmic rays, uh, uh, basically what you can call as space weather varies uh, as uh, the sunspots or the sun is very active. Uh, the magnetic field of uh, the sun diverts those cosmetic cosmic rays away uh, from uh, the Earth. Uh, and in that case, uh, uh, cloud formation, because they act as nucleation sites for droplets of uh, water in the atmosphere, is decreased. And definitely the weather on the Earth is going to vary according to the activity on the sun. Another plot that shows here, uh, that shows us the cosmic rays here and the uh, cosmic rays are higher when uh, the solar constant or the energy we get from the sun, power we get from the sun in watts per meter squared or the uh, power flux from the sun is low, you find that we get uh, uh, more uh, cos uh, uh, the, when the solar constant is high, we get less cosmic rays and vice versa. It's definitely uh, a direct uh, negative correlation in that case. Uh, this is another graph uh, uh, that uh, definitely suggests that uh, the cosmic rays, the higher the cosmic rays, uh, the uh, lower the, uh, uh, the, the higher the cosmic rays, uh, the higher the cloud formation on Earth. Well, that means cooling because it, it, uh, the clouds are shielding uh, the sun rays from the surface of the Earth. And when uh, the uh, uh, cosmic rays are lower, uh, like what we have now, you find that the cloud uh, cover also is uh, lower. Uh, there are nuclear reactions that happen in the atmosphere. I list some of them here. We talked about uh, uh, cosmic radiation uh, generating neutrons that can interact with the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Remember our atmosphere is 70% nitrogen and only 50% oxygen and CO2 and other gases. The neutrons also from cosmic radiation can interact with oxygen 16. And uh, we heard about the famous uh, carbon uh, 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 dating that has to do with uh, the neutrons interacting with carbon 13 and creating carbon 14 in the atmosphere. There are lots of nuclear reactions that I try to document here uh, forming from the interaction of cosmic rays with the, uh, the Earth. Uh, this is a, a complete month of uh, the activity of the sun dating back when they started taking record to 1750. And uh, you could see that uh, 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 there are some misses, some, some years, 1830, uh, for instance, the solar uh, sun sunspots were uh, very low in size that correlated to a low activity in the sun. And uh, from starting from 2010, uh, uh, we have been reaching a minimum. Uh, it went up to 2020, and then we came back to a minimum, and we are recovering now from a new minimum. So this is the uh, monthly average sunspot numbers. So the activity of the sun affects uh, climate on the Earth, 
uh, some people become pessimistic when they see uh, the solar activity going to a minimum around 2010. Uh, but uh, uh, lo and behold, the sun uh, recovers and we get back to solar cycle, the 11 or 22 cycle. This is uh, a period where the solar activity went down uh, in 2000 and uh, in June of 2010. Uh, but right now uh, we are recovering and uh, NOAA and uh, NASA and uh, space agencies basically plot this and they uh, reach some kind of uh, 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 predictions of where the solar cycle will go. For instance, it reached a peak in 2000, it reached a peak in 2015 according to prediction, but the maximum uh, of the solar cycle, the intensity of the, Earth, the sun magnetic field and how it affects cloud formation on Earth was lower uh, in 2015 than it was in 2000. So in that case, uh, we can uh, basically suggest that uh, the sun uh, affects weather on Earth and uh, there is no escaping uh, that uh, fact in general. Uh, in 2019, we started reaching a minimum and we get those data from uh, real uh, actual scientific observations. Uh, this is the SOHO satellite that studies uh, really the Earth and uh, uh, it was launched in 19. 95. You can learn more about it by going to the NASA website in general. Uh, effects on weather on Earth can be very dramatic. Uh, we talk, for instance, about the Maunder minimum that happened over the period of 1645 to 1715. It was named the Little Ice Age, and because in that period the crops failed in Europe. Uh, this is actual uh, drawings from that period. Uh, where people uh, were shown building uh, houses on the liver Thames and ice skating uh, in London. So in that case, crop failed, uh, the sun radiation was weaker, and basically that has nothing to do with human activity, it was the sun really. Uh, and they named it the uh, Little Ice uh, Age. Uh, it saw the river Thames in uh, England basically <laughs> freeze over. Uh, there is an uh, in interpretation that ha has nothing to do with the sun, but it has to do with volcanic activity. When vol volcanoes erupt, they emit gases and uh, uh, volcanoes are notorious for having large amount of sulfur. In fact, uh, people go at uh, uh, the craters of volcanoes and carry sulfur, uh, mine sulfur basically from volcanoes. So when sulfur dioxide is emitted to the atmosphere, it has the opposite effect of the carbon dioxide. It cools uh, the Earth's temperature. So this is a phenomenon. We have no control on volcanoes, obviously, another phenomenon other than the sun uh, that causes the temperature uh, variation on the Earth. Uh, there is a connection to the sun ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, connection, you could see here that uh, there is a correlation, meaning that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between the sun magnetic fields on the top here and the temperature in central England. So uh, definitely uh, uh, there is some kind of uh, effect of the sun on our Earth's climate. And as I suggested, uh, uh, this is what we see when we take a picture of the sun in the ultraviolet range. And uh, these are magnetic fields, solar flares here when, as I suggested, the magnetic field in the corona part of the sun or the outer layer of the sun bulge out of the surface of the sun. Uh, no, that uh, of course uh, suggested for a while, oh, global warming, everybody was talking about global warming, uh, but some other people were talking about cooling trends. <laughs> and uh, the fact is uh, it's a variation, it's gonna change. It varies over different cycles, depending on uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, relative uh, positions and the fluxes that the Earth uh, received from our star, the sun. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Venus uh, has uh, uh, been affected and definitely has some kind of a global warming, runaway global warming effect uh, by uh, the gases that it contains, carbon dioxide primarily. Uh, but uh, humans uh, have been affecting the, the climate. 
uh, we are releasing pollutants to the atmosphere. This is uh, uh, maybe a, a refinery. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't have control, obviously, uh, on the solar effects or volcanic effects. So we have to adapt to them. We have basically, as a human race, we are uh, survivors. We have to adapt to uh, the uh, phenomena that are geographic in nature that we don't have control on. But the ones that we have control on, like the emissions of uh, uh, pollutants and the pollution, uh, uh, the pollution uh, caused by the emission of uh, methane gas. Uh, this is a greenhouse gas. It's not just CO2. Uh, and if you have control on it, we uh, have to uh, uh, not uh, 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 affect the climate of the Earth uh, uh, to our own uh, risk. Uh, there is an analogy to, as I said, that uh, uh, to the planet Venus, we can learn more about, about what can happen to Earth. We can get a runaway greenhouse effect if we do not uh, control uh, in general and uh, the, uh, the emissions that we uh, if, uh, change the composition of our atmosphere. So uh, the Earth can <laughs> become like Venus, uh, where if you send the probe, the Russians send uh, a satellite that uh, uh, landed on Venus and uh, operated only for a few hours and then melted out. The temperature on the surface of Venus would melt lead. Uh, uh, we can quantify this by what's called the infrared forcing formula uh, or the climate sensitivity. And uh, basically uh, it's attributed to a gentleman called Mayer. So it's call it the Mayer uh, radiative forcing formula. And uh, it takes uh, the natural logarithm of the ending CO2 concentrations divided into the starting CO2 concentrations multiplied into uh, a constant 5.35. Uh, this would be the power, uh, power flux or the watts per meter square that we get uh, according to the presence of CO2 on Earth, uh, the increase in general. So it tells us that if you double the CO2 concentration, so that becomes a natural logarithm of two, you can get a, uh, a, a, a heat flux from the sun of 3.71. It's infrared, so infrared means that's heat. However, if you, uh, the pre-industrial CO2 concentration was 280 parts per million. Uh, right now we have increased that number from two 180 parts per million to 400 parts per million. So this is called the forcing that uh, is a natural logarithm of the ratio. So basically we have, uh, have now the, uh, uh, the F here, or the, uh, if you double the CO2 concentration, you get 3.7 watts, but uh, just from the beginning of the industrial age, uh, the, we have increased uh, the number of watts or power uh, flux to 1.91 watts per centimeter uh, cube. So if you take the ratio 1.91 to 3.71, maybe uh, we are talking about half of the forcing towards the CO2 doubling from the pre-industrial age has already been achieved uh, today. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, estimates the temperature increase over the same period of about 0.6 degrees Celsius. And uh, the climate sensitivity now, if we take 0.6 plus or minus 0.2 degrees Celsius, it, says, it shows that we have increased the temperature of the Earth by uh, 1.2 uh, degrees Celsius. It is not of the same magnitude that can happen in say a <coughs> an ice age, but definitely humans, uh, according to the uh, industrial re revolution and the use of steam and uh, burning fossil fuels, we have increased the temperature of uh, the earth. However, as I suggested, uh, there are effects that cause warming, but also effects that cause dimming or uh, cooling. And uh, as I suggested, volcanic eruptions, uh, that's the uh, erection of Mount Minatubo in the Philippines in 1991, it sent 20 million tons of volcanic ash. So that volcanic ash is dust. That is uh, a cooler of uh, the Earth's surface. In addition, volcanoes also send sulfur dioxide to the atmosphere. So we know for sure that the eruption of Mount Pinatubo decreased 
the average temperature of the Earth by 0.5 degrees uh, <laughs> Fahrenheit. And you have no control on this one. Uh, so we have to adapt. Uh, people living in that area but must be evacuated, for instance, during those eruptions. And uh, 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 maybe uh, their livelihood would have to be made elsewhere. Uh, this is something that we have seen uh, immediately in our lifetime in 2010, 11 years ago. That is a volcano eruption in Iceland. And uh, you could see the human dwellings are very close to that uh, volcano there. It's very hard to pronounce. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. It's uh, uh, really an event, a volcanic events are real. So we have what uh, people call the radiation forcings uh, over the period 1750 to 2006. Uh, you'll find that uh, uh, the long lived greenhouse gases, and it's not just CO2, you could see here uh, that CH4, methane, uh, uh, nitrogen oxide, and halocarbons, uh, basically the ozone formation uh, are all positive in their uh, increasing uh, the temperature, the average temperature of the earth. But there is uh, other uh, uh, effects that decreases it too. Uh, so aerosols, when you send the volcanic ash to uh, the volcano send their volcanic ash, uh, they contribute to a decrease in the temperature of uh, the earth. Uh, the total net anthropogenic, meaning that is causing by humans, if you take uh, the CO2 and the CH4 here and add the contributions by humans, uh, you find that we have a net uh, effect uh, where definitely humans have been affecting uh, the uh, increase in uh, the radiative forcing in watts per meter square, but notice in all those estimates uh, how large the error bar is. So we know that, oh, this is the mean value, but think about a normal distribution. And when you go one standard deviation to each side, then uh, this is the estimate over the period 1750 to 2006. So uh, humans have affected the earth and uh, uh, whether phenomena can affect uh, the livelihood of people to a very, very extensive effect, for instance, uh, uh, the Dust Bowl happened in the period of the 1930s in the United States. Imagine uh, people in uh, uh, states like uh, Kansas uh, coming, uh, seeing a huge dust cloud invading uh, their homes and uh, basically forcing them to stay indoors and affecting their lungs. And that continues today. This is in 2009, a dust storm picture, actual picture, uh, in Australia. And uh, some people suggest that it is uh, as an element of introduction by humans by uh, overgrazing the land, not allowing grasses and uh, uh, shrubs to grow. Uh, so the wind comes in and uh, 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 raises that dust into the atmosphere. And then, of course, it ends up in uh, the lungs and the dwellings of humans uh, in general. Uh, possible consequences of uh, our uh, messing up with the Earth's climate is that you can get species extensions if they don't have time to adjust. Uh, you can have reduced food production in some areas, but increased food production in other areas. For instance, it is determined that the climatic change in the United States is moving from south to north. So the crops that grow in Texas now are better uh, growing, like wheat, but better growing in maybe Illinois and whatever grows in Illinois now uh, is better growing in Canada. Uh, that would include higher food prices, uh, like what happens in the Middle East, uh, causing human migration to Europe and even in Central America, wars, civil wars in Syria, uh, as a result of those droughts, uh, people moving across borders when they cannot make a living. So. Uh, and we can get the oceanic uh, disruptions in general. So the effects are being studied by scientists and engineers and they are very, very uh, significant uh, in general. And uh, some of the observation, for instance, have, uh, are uh, in the presence of glaciers. You find that the glaciers on Earth are shrinking. So that is uh, associated with some form of increase in the temperature of the Earth. This is a glacier. Uh, that uh, people were visiting. And look at the picture here from 1932 here. This is a picture of the glacier at the same location. Look at that peak of the mountain here and there. And that glacier 
has disappeared, totally disappeared in 1988. This means that the glacier has melted out. Glaciers are uh, rivers of ice that come in from snow that accumulates on mountain slopes and then uh, flows downward uh, to uh, rivers and lakes uh, in general. This is another picture of Antarctica. Antarctica supposedly is losing its ice shelf. Uh, the, this is the land of Antarctica, but the ice is surrounding uh, the, uh, and it, it is flowing towards the, the ocean. And that happened in 2000. 1,300 square miles of that ground, uh, ice shelf here has simply uh, disappeared. And uh, some people attribute it to the change in the temperature of the Earth. So the glaciers uh, in Iceland uh, definitely are uh, retreating uh, in general. Uh, something very important uh, that have to we take into consideration is what's called the Earth's Great Conveyor Belt. Uh, the solar radiation that comes to us from the Earth is absorbed by 70% of the Earth's surface that is the ocean. So the water uh, absorbs that energy from the sun. Now definitely also, the uh, land masses, but uh, the water circulates. Land masses is constant there. Vegetation absorbs the heat, uh, but uh, the water in the oceans absorbs the heat in the sun. And we have two colors here. We have a red color. This is when the uh, Earth's conveyor belt, which is the currents in the ocean, absorb the heat from the sun, so they are warm. Uh, let's look at what happens here in the United States. They come into the area of Florida and the Gulf of Mexico, then they turn around uh, into the Gulf Stream and heat up Europe. So Europe uh, owes its uh, uh, mild and warm climate to that heating from the ocean current. Uh, the ocean current keeps going to Iceland and then it cools down and sinks and returns back again, goes uh, uh, are in the Atlantic Ocean all the way to Antarctica, it splits into two parts and then uh, heats up in the Pacific Ocean uh, and uh, the Atlantic uh, Ocean, that's a Pacific here, the, Pac the Pacific here and there from both sides of South America and then in the Indian Ocean and uh, the cycle uh, continues uh, in general. So in that case, uh, the, uh, you find that if you think about uh, Europe in general, uh, Europe here, let's take uh, the area of France, for instance, is really at the same level as Ontario in Canada. And you know that Canada uh, is not receiving that warm uh, air from the uh, ocean currents. It's very cold. They have, uh, they, uh, at Ontario, Canada, for instance, you move from one building to the other in tunnels underground. Uh, it's very cold in the winter, but uh, that Gulf Stream heats up Europe. So the Europeans are much more concerned about any change in the flow of the currents uh, uh, of water in the oceans because they'll get into an ice age if there is any disruption to uh, that uh, Gulf Stream. And in fact, people are worried about a disruption uh, in the flow where uh, the water would not start sinking down. So that would stop the flow of the, or expected to stop the flow to the warm uh, currents to Europe and uh, Europe will turn into an ice age. So you find the Europeans, every European thinking about his carbon uh, imprint, whereas in the United States, uh, we are not worried about it so far. At some point we are going to uh, uh, be affected by it. So suppose that uh, the effects of global warming affects that uh, global conveyor belt. Uh, so what uh, can, can humanity uh, survive it as a hurdle or as a filter. Remember the Kantorovich uh, filters and the Fermi paradox uh, uh, is uh, uh, a technological civilization is going to end in that case. Well, not necessarily because uh, uh, the effect is going to be of uh, warming of the earth. Uh, first, we are going to melt the, uh, the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean right now is ice, but it could melt. Antarctica's ice could also melt. And that would be the same situation as happened 30 million years ago. Uh, it is not new uh, in the history of the geology of the Earth. And at that time, uh, the Earth enjoyed, in fact, I say the word enjoyed, a very mild climate, very nice uh, uh, climate, uh, uh, 
uh, and you notice here the flows of the uh, global climatic current, it uh, was connecting the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean through what is today the Isthmus of Panama. And uh, it was a very mild climate. We had mastodons in Northern Europe. Now it's all ice and uh, Antarctica is two miles deep ice uh, accumulated uh, there. So a suggestion is say, if we get an uncontrolled global warming, uh, and uh, this is something that could be uh, happening is to uh, the solution would be for humanity to try to reconnect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, and in that case, through engineering, uh, this is called now terraforming or uh, uh, ter uh, yeah, terraforming or uh, uh, geologic kind of engineering. Uh, that could be a remedy. So if we can restore that very nice mild climate that existed 30 million years ago, we can expect to humanity and our technological civilization to continue for a much more longer time. And that uh, uh, is affecting the L factor in the Drake's equation, uh, the longevity factor, so our civilization can uh, last longer. But lot is here again, the interconnectivity between the Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean. And uh, if uh, people uh, uh, really do not address global warming, uh, nature will do it for them. So in that case, uh, the temperature increase will melt the ice caps, the, uh, the Arctic ice and the Antarctica's ice. Uh, uh, the temperature also through the uh, just uh, yeah. the, the increase in the temperature of the water uh, in the ocean will cause it to expand. Uh, the water levels are going to increase. Large cities in the world along the oceans like Venice will disappear underwater, Louisiana and the United States. And uh, uh, the increase in the water would uh, reconnect uh, basically if no other seismic, seismic effects uh, uh, occur, the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and Earth will correct itself. So if it is not done by humans, uh, <laughs> nature will do it for them. Uh, and again, as a fact, it's a fact, this is Mount Kilimanjaro uh, in Africa. The top of it was covered in ice and you could see it's melting. And in fact, uh, uh, the Arctic Ocean, you could see here, that's the extent of the ice uh, there. Uh, it is decreasing, so at one point it would be open water. Well, an advantage is that uh, North America would be connected to Asia through the Arctic. Uh, some uh, of our, our students have been thinking about uh, building more like uh, 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 ships, cargo ships, that would uh, be like submarines connecting North America to Asia. It's a shorter route, as you could see, than going all the way around the circumference of the Earth. So uh, humans can survive it as long as they adapt to uh, the change uh, in general. Uh, uh, carbon dioxide concentration has been increasing. There is no doubt about it. And it comes from actual observations. Uh, Tom Barrow in Alaska, uh, flights by Sweden, uh, the volcanoes in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, and at the South Pole. These are all measurements that show us that the CO2 concentration increased from 300 parts per million uh, uh, to right now we are in the range of 370 uh, parts per million. And uh, the variation uh, depends on the seasons because in uh, the summer, carbon dioxide is fixed in uh, plant life. Uh, so you could see fluctuation in the winter that uh, the uh, uh, biological matter like plants decay and the CO2 is released back to the atmosphere. But uh, from 1958 to 2004 here, you could see that the concentration in parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased from 315 to 380 parts per, per million. There is an ex inexorable uh, increase and uh, uh, this curve is named the Keeling curve after the gentleman who developed it for us. That's, uh, and it is continuing. Uh, there is no stop really uh, by humanity in the use of uh, fossil uh, fuel. Uh, what I would like uh, to do is, oh, uh, before I go further, it, it has to do, of course, uh, it affects uh, the increase in CO2 affects the uh, uh, temperature on the Earth's surface. And this is 
uh, described by the relative increase in concentration, you'll find that the relative increase has been uh, 0.08 or 8 percent. And uh, uh, that relative increase per year is uh, 0 .004, 0 0.004 per percent in general. And uh, just from the time of the industrial age to uh, say uh, 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 from 327 minus 225 uh, uh, divided into 295 at the beginning of the industrial age. So we have increased the CO2 concentration by uh, uh, point. 10.5, 10 percent in that case. Uh, the effects of the increase on CO2 and CH4 concentration definitely are affecting the uh, temperature of uh, the Earth. And uh, the data comes from atmospheric measurements as well as those ice core data, both in uh, uh, Iceland as well as uh, from uh, the South Pole in general. So the five-year average of the temperature of the Earth is definitely increasing, uh, either the annual average each point and, uh, or the five-year average. And uh, uh, there is no doubt that it is. So uh, we cannot deny that. Uh, the heating comes in, uh, in the, by the greenhouse effect, as you know. Uh, the delta G, or the temperature increase uh, the, in degrees Celsius, depends on the, num uh, the doubling here to uh, NCO2, tripling or quadrupling of the CO2 concentration. The weak bands, uh, basically at a quadrupling of the CO2 concentration will contribute one uh, degree Celsius to the temperature of the Earth, but the bands in the 15 micrometer range uh, at say a doubling would increase the temperature of the Earth by 1.5 degrees. And if you quadruple it, uh, you can increase the temperature of the Earth by three and a half degrees Celsius. So that is significant. Uh, and the correlation between the CO2 uh, and the uh, 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 energy consumption. And unfortunately, uh, most of our use today in the Sankey diagram that I've shown you at the beginning of the semester, uh, mostly uh, what uh, we are still using a very tiny amount of renewables. We need to double and quadruple uh, the amounts that we get from wind and solar energy. We are still only getting our electricity here. You could see here, uh, primarily from coal and petroleum is used in the transportation uh, system. Natural gas is contributing a little bit to electricity, but also to residential use and industrial use. We are still dependent fully on the hydrocarbons, which are really stored energy from nuclear energy, from the fusion in our sun, the sun. Uh, energy has been stored over 200 million years. And now we are using dead plants and dead animals over a 200 year period, we are depleting it. And uh, humanity is facing a hurdle here uh, in the increase in the uh, burning of the fossil fuels. We really need to uh, seriously uh, switch to renewables uh, in combination to uh, nuclear energy uh, in general. Uh, some people suggest that the increased level of uh, CO2, uh, uh, this is the consumption of natural energy, natural gas, oil, and coal, and uh, uh, a 50 terawatt, because there is an increase in the use of energy in the earth, would lead basically uh, to uh, an increase by the year 2100 that is very significant if we continue at the present rate. So at some point we have to think about uh, switching uh, to renewables and nuclear uh, energy. Uh, I want to become a little more quantitative. So I asked myself the question, all right, if we double or we quadruple uh, the CO2 concentration in the Earth's crust, how can we expect it to affect the weather? Well, some people are using uh, large computers for that and supercomputers, and uh, uh, some people are uh, accused of fudging the results. So uh, I tried to figure it out based on uh, 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 an analytical model, uh, conduction model, uh, just an analytic formula. So I would like to share that uh, with you. Notice that. Uh, uh, the CO2 increase in concentration may not have uh, totally uh, bad effects as I suggested uh, because uh, 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 CO2 is food for plants. So there is an expectation 
of an increase in the food supply uh, because it increases corn, potato, wheat, and uh, sugar beets, soybeans uh, 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 production. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we can uh, have also very deleterious effects. So it's a balance between the risks. Now let us uh, develop a model for what to expect if we double and if we quadruple the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. To be able to do that, we need to find out what are the effects of doubling or quadrupling, say, as an example, the CO2 concentration in the Earth's crust. And in that case, we uh, try to look at the heat fluxes from where the weather phenomena are occurring in the atmosphere. Uh, on the Earth, the uh, weather phenomena occur in that region uh, of space, uh, uh, the atmosphere around the Earth at 25,000 feet. This is the altitude in 25,000 feet. And uh, you notice in that case that uh, uh, at 25,000 feet, that's where airplanes really fly. And that's what you could see in the summer, the beautiful uh, cumulus nimbus clouds, uh, like the form of cotton balls uh, uh, increasing. So the, the temperature of the troposphere is where really uh, the Earth's atmosphere has enough of a high density to affect the weather phenomena. And the temperature of the atmosphere varies from uh, the bottom of the atmosphere uh, to that height of the stratosphere. So commercial airplanes basically fly uh, close to the atmosphere. Uh, uh, cloud formation uh, can be very close to the Earth's surface. Uh, but the troposphere and the, strat the stratosphere, where weather balloons are being sent, in fact, as you could see here, this is where the weather phenomena occur. Now, measurements through those balloons uh, of different temperatures uh, from the troposphere, which is close to the Earth's surface, to the stratosphere varies. So if I'm near the surface of the Earth, uh, you can have a high temperature. This is a scale of temperatures in degrees Celsius, maybe 19 degrees Celsius, but as you go up in the atmosphere, you find that the temperature decreases uh, to uh, from uh, uh, here uh, uh, 20 degrees Celsius to minus uh, maybe 50 degrees Celsius. It remains constant for a while, but uh, in the stratosphere, it starts increasing again. And uh, this temperature distribution means that you have a heat flux from the region of high temperature, in this case here, uh, to the region of low a temperature. So we try to uh, uh, estimate the heat flux uh, that happens <laughs> in different parts of the atmosphere. Uh, somebody uh, in the bulletin of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, tried to uh, estimate, uh, show the temperature variation uh, according to that model uh, in uh, the Earth's surface up to the stratosphere. Somebody else can go up higher, and uh, but uh, uh, we consider the heat flows in the atmosphere as a simple model. So this is uh, what we get as uh, uh, the temperature near the Earth's surface uh, in kelvins. They still, uh, when the graph was published, they use a, a terminology degrees Kelvin. Now today we don't use that degree Kelvin. But uh, it would be 273 plus here, the temperature right here. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, we'll take uh, uh, the actual value from the IAE bulletin here. And you notice that as the temperature, uh, as we go up in altitude to about 12 kilometers, that is the area of the uh, stratosphere. Uh, the temperature goes at, reaches, a minimum and then starts increasing back again into the stratosphere. And this depends on the uh, amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere in parts per million, and the V here indicates it's parts per million per volume. So uh, notice here that uh, that graph uh, is higher than the two other graphs uh, where the temperature vary the position uh, of the solid line is 150 parts per million, uh, whereas the dotted lines uh, take a doubling from 150 to 300 parts per million per volume. And uh, then you double it another time, uh, quadrupling it in that case to 600 parts per million per volume. Uh, and uh, depending on the temperature near the Earth's surface, which is 
energy trapped by the greenhouse effect because of the presence of CO2 in the thick part or the dense part of the atmosphere, you notice that the slopes are varying. Uh, you see here that uh, near the Earth, uh, the 150 part per million uh, leads to a lower temperature than uh, when you quadruple it, the temperature obviously increases, but uh, the energy from the sun is a constant. So as a result, you find that the slope of the curves reverses above the troposphere above 12 kilometers. So what do we do here? Uh, we can uh, build a very simple analytical model using the process of conduction. Uh, we take the Earth's surface here uh, uh, with uh, the given temperature for the initial 150 parts per million uh, up to a height of the uh, troposphere, T sub M here, and then we continue it as uh, a curve uh, to above the troposphere. And uh, we make it uh, some kind of param parameterized, so the at, uh, height of the troposphere is small r, and uh, the distance above the troposphere where weather phenomena are affected is small s. So you find that uh, uh, the temperature distribution close to the Earth's surface varies up to the troposphere, and uh, it, uh, uh, the temperature as you double and quadruple the carbon dioxide, uh, 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 the slope changes, and then it reverses uh, itself because we have a constant amount of energy from the sun coming to, to the earth. Uh, the curve that was uh, the lowest becomes the highest in terms of the temperature above the uh, atmosphere. Now, if you have a slope of a curve between a temperature T sub M and T sub two here, or T sub M and T sub one, uh, you notice that, of course, you get a heat flux. And uh, the heat flux from uh, the surface of the Earth uh, goes up to the troposphere, where the weather phenomena are being made, and the temperature flux from above the troposphere comes back to the troposphere. And these are two heat fluxes. And the heat flux, as you know, depends on the temperature. The temperature is a scalar. And Fourier law of conduction takes a gradient of the temperature which is a scalar and gives us a vector. So here, the heat flux uh, in this direction is a vector and the heat flux from the upper atmosphere to the troposphere area is also a vector. And you know that vectors cancel each other. So they are in opposite direction. So the question is, when we move from that slope here to that slope here, meaning different uh, concentration of CO2 or temperature near the Earth's surface, uh, how does the heat flux in the troposphere be affected? And if we do this, we get an estimate of how, what is the effect of the CO2 increasing uh, and the slopes changing on the heat flux. And that would be a good estimate of the severity of the weather phenomenon. So all we do is uh, apply basically, uh, uh, considered as a steady state, uh, we are not having a supercomputer, we are going to try it solving the equation of heat conduction. Uh, this is a del square temperature as a function of height above the Earth's surface is equal to zero. So this is a Laplacian. And uh, if we take it in Cartesian coordinates, it's D by Z, the height, uh, and the T is the temperature D squared by T, Z squared, uh, DZ squared is equal to zero. That's a Laplacian del square T is equal to zero. Uh, you can solve any differential equation like this one if you know the boundary conditions. So we'll call the uh, temperature at a height of the troposphere T sub M uh, at the Earth's surface Z zero, we call it TS for T sub sur the surface. And uh, above the atmosphere, uh, we take the height of the troposphere plus the thickness of the area above the troposphere, we call this T upper. And all we do now is solve the differential equation and apply those uh, temperature uh, values uh, 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 in them, but our goal uh, is not going to get really the temperature distributions per se, but uh, uh, since we do not know what is the conductivity of the Earth, we eliminate uh, the conduction uh, factor and only estimate the heat fluxes. So uh, it's a, some kind of a unique way of parameterizing uh, the, the equation. So uh, in the lower atmosphere region one, we solve the Laplacian equation and uh, uh, one integration gives you a constant of integration. Integrating a second time uh, gives you a second constant of integration C1 and C2. And you notice that the temperature from the Earth to the troposphere follows a straight line. This is a line 
that has two constants here uh, as a function of height above the Earth's surface. If we apply the boundary conditions, we can determine C1 and C2. So at the Earth's surface, uh, uh, you'll find that uh, yeah, Ts is equal to the height Z0, and that gives you uh, the temperature at the surface. It gives you the value of C2 as being here T sub S, and uh, from which you can rewrite the equation now as C1Z plus uh, Ts, and uh, uh, C2 in that case is uh, the value of the first constant. Uh, you substitute, they apply the second boundary condition to determine the, the value of C1. In that uh, case, uh, the temperature at the uh, troposphere itself. And it gives you a value of the constant of integration C1 as T sub M minus T sub S divided into the height of the troposphere. Uh, so in that case, so yes, we can get really a temperature distribution. And you could see, again, it's a straight line depending on the differential in temperature uh, and the surface of the Earth's temperature. In the region two of the upper atmosphere, we can do the same thing, integrate once and integrate twice. You get two constants of integrations. We apply the boundary conditions. Uh, you can follow the detail there and you get also the temperature distribution in the upper atmosphere. Well, fine, but uh, what we are interested in is the heat fluxes. And the equation for the heat flux is the uh, Fourier law of conduction. Uh, remember that the heat flux is a vector and the gradient of the temperature, the temperature is a scalar, but when you take the gradient of a scalar, we said earlier uh, in uh, our criticality kind of uh, uh, solutions to the neutron diffusion equation that the gradient gives you a vector. And uh, that the heat flux depends on the area through which the heat is uh, flowing, the conduction process, and K uh, is the conductivity of the Earth. So we really don't know what is K, we don't know what is A exactly. So what we do is parameterize the process. We take values of this uh, heat flux at different heights in uh, the atmosphere. So we can calculate now uh, the gradient as dT by dZ. Uh, this is the heat flux in region one, and that is the value of it. And uh, we can also calculate the heat flux in region Q2. Now, these are two vectors that move in opposite direction. So what can we do? We can take the delta Q or the difference between uh, the two heat fluxes, the net heat flux, uh, and uh, divided it by uh, the value of the heat flux near the Earth as a reference value. And lo and behold, you don't need to know the conductivity or the area uh, through which the conduction is occurring. And basically, you can calculate uh, a uh, the net heat flux to the troposphere. Let's take a typical numerical example to show uh, how this interesting solution gives us. Uh, the height of the troposphere, we said it's about 13 kilometers. Uh, we temperature uh, near uh, at there is uh, 210 uh, degrees, uh, not, not degrees Kelvin, but Kelvins. And uh, the height S is 40 kilometers minus 13 here, that's 27 kilometers. So, you can go and uh, in the solution and modify those numbers any way you like, and you'll get some slightly uh, different uh, results. As I suggested, we want to eliminate the conductivity of the Earth and the area of the conduction of the temperature. So we take the net heat flux, uh, the energy of the heat uh, flux from the Earth to the troposphere minus a reference value relative to this, the heat flux as a reference value. And we take the reference value, uh, the 150 parts per million before the industrial revolution. And this is a Q net, uh, the difference between the upgoing heat flux and the downgoing heat flux. Uh, we can put this into a small table here. Uh, we suggested that at 150 parts per million per volume carbon dioxide, the surface temperature is 273 plus uh, uh, 273 plus 20 here or 19 degrees, uh, so it's 282. And uh, the suggestion in the graph uh, uh, is that the temperature increases by two degrees if we double that concentration of CO2, and uh, if we double it another time, uh, we increase the temperature by another two degrees, so quadrupling uh, the uh, CO2 concentration. Uh, in volume, uh, increase the temperature by four degrees from 282 to 886. 
Uh, we can also calculate the upper level temperature. Uh, uh, and uh, from there, we can calculate the temperature gradient in the lower atmosphere in both cases. Uh, this is a reference value. And uh, we can uh, basically calculate the temperature gradient in the upper atmosphere in both cases. You notice here that as you uh, the temperature gradient increases when you double uh, the heat, uh, uh, when you double the concentration of CO2, as well when you quadruple the concentration of CO2, but uh, the temperature gradient from the top of the atmosphere decreases as you are doubling it. So what is the net heat flux? Uh, multiplied by the conductivity of the Earth and its area, you notice that at the reference value of 150 parts per million, the net heat flux is 3.35. Uh, if you uh, double the carbon dioxide, that heat flux becomes four uh, relative to 3.35. And that is a factor of 22.4%. If you apply the equation that we suggested here, the net heat flux, minus the reference heat flux relative to the, uh, uh, re uh, to the reference uh, heat flux. So what does it mean? It means that the intensity of heat flux is a troposphere where the weather phenomena are occurring. If you double the concentration of CO2, uh, the relative increase in the heat flux is 22%. 22% means that your any weather phenomena, whether it's a drought, a uh, hurricane, uh, uh, rain, uh, storms, uh, uh, any weather phenomena uh, from drought to increased rainfall uh, is increased by 20%. And if you allow the uh, temperature gradients to vary from the surface of the Earth to the troposphere, uh, if you quadruple the carbon dioxide, then that increase can be 40%. And uh, it's amazing that uh, uh, without considering convection, which is, of course, where we need supercomputer for uh, determining this uh, variation here, just using conduction, we can predict that doubling the carbon dioxide uh, effect increases the heat fluxes or the severity of the weather phenomena by 22%. And if we quadruple them, uh, we can increase that to 40%. So it's, uh, there is an effect that humans can have uh, and it's not just a matter of increasing temperature. Now you could see that this is a destruction uh, of, uh, other than the increase in the water level of the oceans and the flooding of coastal cities, the change in the climate, uh, the climatic variations would be like uh, storms and uh, droughts are going to be also severely, in severely increased. That quadrupling, uh, it's almost a 40% increase in the intensity of storms in general based on a very simple uh, model. And uh, there is no doubt that, uh, uh, that this would happen if we uh, allow the increase in the carbon dioxide and continue uh, the use of release of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere uh, in terms. Uh, so, so in that case, you would think that uh, hurricanes and uh, uh, weather phenomena are going to increase in, in intensity as we increase the uh, amount, double, double or quadruple the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere per uh, volume. Uh, the change in the atmosphere can happen in a very abrupt way. Uh, that somebody had a movie uh, on it and uh, an abrupt climate change and its implication uh, for the United States security, you find that uh, basically uh, uh, a very sudden uh, possibility exists of uh, turning the mild climate on the Earth now into a very severe ice age. And uh, there was a movie uh, put along this line. And it may happen, uh, have happened in the past. For instance, we know that the mammoths uh, are uh, still preserved in uh, Siberia uh, from the time where, as I suggested, the Earth had a very nice mild climate uh, in the past. Uh, local climatic change should be expected. You'll have a shift in the agricultural production zones. You'll have seasonal changes. Uh, and uh, in that case, it can be really uh, difficult. Uh, some pessimistic people say, okay, it is going to happen regardless. Humans are not smart enough. Uh, for instance, here we have started a pandemic by doing what they call uh, 
gain of function research uh, making uh, viruses more viral on the premise that, oh, we can build uh, uh, better vaccines when we make the virus more, uh, 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 more uh, virulent. And in the process, they have been killing millions of people and there is a threat of uh, wiping out humanity if uh, the viruses become more and more vi virtual. So this is human stupidity uh, in play and it can basically decrease uh, the capital L or the longevity factor of our technological civilization. So uh, what is really making biological weapons is disguised as being gain of function research and the logic is totally flawed in that case. Uh, well, uh, with uh, global climatic change, we may have a venue uh, in uh, the history of the earth, as I suggested uh, the uh, 30 million years ago, uh, the Earth had a milder climate. So if we get a runaway increase in the global warming, can we do something about it? Yes, we can. Uh, the suggestion here is uh, uh, would involve what we would call uh, planetary engineering uh, or uh, terraforming the Earth in a different way by restoring the period uh, that existed in the past where uh, the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean were interconnected. And that was at the time of the Jurassic in general. Uh, so in that case, uh, nuclear energy, that's how it relates to nuclear energy now, uh, can be used to reconnect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, uh, today uh, they are connected through the Panama Canal, but the Panama Canal is not a, 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 a sea level type of a canal. Uh, the Panama Canal, as you could see here, is a system of locks and dams. Ships come from one side, they are placed in a lock, the water level in the lock is uh, raised. You can uh, check this uh, over the summer at Fort Sault Ste. Marie and between, uh, uh, in, uh, between Michigan <coughs> and Wisconsin. Uh, the ships are raised into a waterway that goes to a lake, Lake Gatun. And then they're lowered on the other side. So it is not a sea level canal. If you want to connect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, we need a sea level canal. And this is actually uh, the, how the Panama Canal operates from the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the ships are raised uh, to Lake Gatun, uh, a freshwater, freshwater lake. They sail there uh, to the other side, to the Pacific Ocean and they are lowered back again in the system of locks and dams. And uh, this is actually an elevation cut through the Panama Canal from the Atlantic Ocean here. You could see one, two, three locks raise the ship into Lake Gatun. They ship sail there, and then they're lowered one, two, three uh, into the Pacific Ocean. If you want to reconnect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean through so, uh, uh, Terraforming, we need to use uh, uh, sources of power. In that case, uh, 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 we would like to reconnect the Atlantic to the Pacific. And the way to do it is uh, through uh, a discipline that can be called nuclear civil engineering. And they can do this at different location. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, one of them is, is in Mexico, one in, in Costa Rica, one in Panama. And uh, you notice if you take the, uh, uh, the, uh, through the uh, cut through Panama, this is the shortest uh, length of the canal, that 31 kilometers or miles, that's in miles. And uh, the relative cost, uh, if you use uh, conventional explosives, uh, would be 3.71 to when uh, you do it at the Panama uh, area. And on a map, uh, it can be shown and basically you use uh, thermonuclear uh, explosives uh, with small canister diameters. And in that case, you use the nuclear explosive uh, as a source of very concentrated energy uh, to reconnect the uh, Atlantic Ocean here to the Pacific Ocean as it was 30 million years ago. If you don't do it, as I suggested, nature will do it for us. It will melt the ice caps and simply reconnect them uh, whether humans like it or not. The shorter distance is here, those 37 miles uh, through Panama, but there is possibility 
<coughs> through Venezuela, Nicaragua, in particular here in Venezuela, and uh, people in these countries would be basically compensated for allowing uh, that reconnection to happen in a, in a more detailed way. The, the best or the shortest route, so just 37 miles only. Uh, uh, this is uh, where the existing Panama Canal uh, is. Another route exists in Panama. Uh, so Panama uh, would be compensated if this is allowed. And how do you do this? You have peaceful nuclear explosions uh, exploded in a row underground. And uh, the depths uh, uh, could be, un yeah, it's underground. The ejecta from the explosions exploded all at the same time. So you, when you explode nuclear explosive in a uh, row of lines, uh, you create basically a ditch. Uh, the ejecta from the ditch will fall on both sides there. And uh, you can have a thousand feet waterway uh, connecting the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, uh, the distribution now of the heat uh, <coughs> through the, uh, the global uh, uh, current uh, would be mild and uh, we can turn the temperature uh, or the climate of the Earth back to 30 million years ago where we had a very mild climate where the mastodons lived in the areas of Siberia and North, North uh, Pole in general. So this is a, a possible use of nuclear energy if humans are stupid enough to allow uh, global warming to become a runaway uh, effect. There have been experiments in what was called the plowshare program uh, that was uh, 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 started in uh, trying to do excavations using nuclear explosive. And this is a documentation here of one single explosion creating, as you could see, a crater. The Russians use it to build a, a, an artificial lake and a dam. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the large explosions on the kiloton of TNT creating what's called the Sedan uh, uh, experiment. And you could see here vehicles. Do you see this uh, truck here or car? It gives an idea about the size that uh, you can excavate a crater. But if you explode the craters in a straight line, as you could see here, this was using chemical explosives. No, actually, uh, one kiloton TNT, you can create basically a ditch. And if you do it on a long distance, uh, 37 miles, you can build a sea level canal. Not only that, uh, but that uh, canal can be uh, used to uh, uh, have. Uh, uh, because there is a difference in height between the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the difference in height comes from the different evaporation rates. Uh, you can allow that flow of water from one ocean to the other to produce electricity, and uh, that doesn't didn't have been studied. Uh, what has been studied to a certain extent is how much radiation do you generate. So I give here a, a, an estimate of uh, some different isotopes, sodium-24, potassium-230. These are uh, isotopes that emit beta, minus, and gamma rays, but they have very short half-life. So that's in the hours, days, days. Uh, iron-55 will remain for a few years, but they're all short-term isotopes that will decay eventually and uh, uh, restore uh, the level of radioactivity to the natural uh, environment. Uh, uh, upon excavation, uh, there will be a fallout effect of tritium particularly. So people would have to be temporarily evacuated, but then tritium has only a half-life of 12%. So within every year, we lose 5% of the radioactive tritium uh, because these are thermonuclear explosives that use a, a DT uh, thermonuclear reaction. Uh, basically within a few years, uh, we are back to the natural radiation uh, environment. But the benefit to Earth uh, would be simply uh, very beneficial. Okay, now this is one solution that uh, uh, I have the pleasure to suggest here uh, in restoring the uh, uh, the interglobal uh, uh, the, uh, global uh, equatorial uh, current. Uh, however, of course, uh, this have to be associated with other methods of carbon management. Uh, for instance. Uh, uh, the efficiency uh, in producing electricity in the United States is only 33%. So definitely you can reduce the amount of fossil fuel used by reducing the amount of electric, uh, by increasing the efficiency, uh, uh, for instance, light water reactors and uh, 
only have an efficiency of 30%. If you would switch to high temperature gas cooled reactors, we can increase that to 60, 70%. Uh, we have to develop uh, low uh, cost methods of carbon sequestration technologies. In that case, uh, research on using clean coal can be also uh, developed. So that's another way of uh, 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 reducing the carbon emission in the Earth's uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, you can use uh, fuels that contain less or no carbon, like if you use methane, natural gas CH4, instead of burning uh, coal, uh, you find that the hydrogen uh, num uh, to carbon ratio in methane is four, whereas in uh, coal, it's one. Uh, there is a factor that people uh, say that deforestation is causing uh, uh, the increase in the carbon dioxide. Uh, that uh, factor is being refuted here. It is not. Uh, real, uh, and uh, some people suggest that algae would be a way of uh, storing the energy. Some people suggest that we uh, have to store uh, carbon. The effects are very, very minimal. Some people even suggested that we seed the oceans with iron dust. And in that case, you help the plankton fix the carbon fixation. Uh, that has been tried to a certain degree, and uh, but it is not really uh, uh, very uh, uh, established, uh, still is in the research stage. Uh, you can, uh, of course, uh, use iron sulfate, imitate what happened in volcanic dust. If you seed iron sulfate in the atmosphere, uh, you decrease the temperature of the earth. And some people even suggested that uh, basically you shade the earth, that's the ideas of uh, uh, by Myler. Uh, sheets uh, into the atmosphere that would act as mirrors and reflect back solar radiation. Uh, these are all pie in the sky ideas. Uh, uh, the real engineering one is to reconnect uh, the Atlantic uh, Ocean to the Pacific Ocean as happened 30 years ago. Uh, very far-fetched ideas is carbon catching. Uh, they say, oh, let's build artificial trees that would extract carbon dioxide from an atmosphere. And this is a concept, uh, uh, our artist conception on how that uh, CO2 catcher is going to be. Uh, you can uh, do cloud seeding. And uh, uh, this is an interesting project uh, published uh, uh, in the uh, British Society uh, 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 publications. Uh, and uh, the idea here is to use what's called the Plettner turbine. And this is a turbine that uh, would use, uh, basically it's a wind turbine uh, that uh, would rotate, rotate drive propellers of ships that would go through the oceans. Uh, part of the energy produced from wind power uh, would propel the ships, but part of it would pump air from the oceans and generate a spray in the atmosphere. And that spray supposedly is gener would generate low-lying clouds that can uh, shade the Earth from the uh, uh, effect of the solar uh, radiation. Uh, uh, this uses what's called the Magnus effect. So if you get to our uh, website that describes wind power generation, you can learn about the Magnus effect and the flattener, flattener rotors that uh, are using wind energy basically to reduce the uh, solar heat flux on uh, the, the Earth. Uh, uh, some people suggest that the cooling, using cooling towers instead of lake, cooling lakes as a nuclear power plant here with a cooling tower that uh, the cooling towers uh, evaporate the cooling water and uh, can cause or help reduce the uh, uh, atmospheric, uh, the reflection of the earth. And this is a, a Google picture of, from the top of a nuclear power plant, the Byron nuclear power plant in Illinois here. You could see that those cooling towers uh, do contribute to the formation of a uh, significant amount of cloud in general. Carbon capture and storage, we have talked about uh, this, uh, reducing methane, uh, producing methane out of coal, uh, uh, the effect of nitrogen oxide. So it is an ongoing topic of research uh, uh, in general. Uh, some people are opposing this idea uh, very strongly. So you would like to, uh, by le to learn about the topic, you need to read about the proponents as well as the opponents. And uh, some people suggest that uh, the whole thing is really related to uh, 
geography and the sun not related to human activity whatsoever but uh, the evidence is that it's a combination uh, of both uh, uh, for the uh, effects that are caused by uh, the geography and by uh, solar phenomena we have to learn to adapt as humans uh, the other effect that uh, we are contributing ourselves this is under our control and uh, we have basically to act on it. Uh, Mr. Harold Lewis uh, is a scientist that also uh, suggests that all the effects on the temperature increase by CO2 is humbug and uh, uh, the, he calls it pseudoscientific fraud. Uh, so we may like to read also about the opposing point of view and then make up your own mind about uh, uh, what it is since you are all uh, the new generation of knowledgeable people, scientists and engineers in general. There are arguments and counter arguments. I tried to some kind of expose them here, uh, but uh, uh, the Kyoto Protocol has been uh, an international agreement to reduce the emissions of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, there have been conferences in Cancun, Mexico, and uh, again in New York, and uh, uh, they show us here like, uh, uh, cities of the world like Sydney, Paris, uh, uh, that would be uh, our, our, uh, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, and uh, uh, different, uh, uh, that meeting United Nations Climate Change Conference, basically, again, uh, many countries in the world have committed themselves to reducing CO2 emissions. The United States has withdrawn from the treaty at the time of President uh, Donald Trump, it seems that we are going to rejoin uh, it back at the time of President uh, 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 Biden. Uh, uh, the Paris Climate Change Agreement in 2016, uh, again, that is, uh, has lots of proponents and uh, uh, basically the, uh, the, <coughs> the, the effect, uh, the uh, argument continues. <laughs> Uh, uh, the, uh, as I suggested that uh, uh, the warming can cause a rise in the ocean uh, sea level. It's not because just of the uh, melting of the Arctic ice and the Antarctica ice, but just the expansion as a result of temperature of the water by an increase in temperature. So many parts of the world can go underwater. Uh, Venice, uh, uh, Flo uh, the many parts of Florida in general, this is a simulation uh, about what happens if uh, the melting of the green uh, Greenland ice sheet, uh, basically you can get a rise of the global sea level in the next 100 years in general. So that is uh, one big concern, like uh, many parts of the world will be underwater and then we run out with uh, hundreds of thousands, not, not millions of refugees uh, seeking shelter in different places. Uh, the warming can increase the acidity of the ocean. So if it increases the acidity of the oceans, they affect the algae growth. And some people suggest that if you affect the algae growth, the fish supply, oh, that's a food supply, could be jeopardized uh, uh, in general. Uh, that could affect also the uh, circadian cycles of plants and animals. So we'll have a very, very different world if we continue the process. And it's already happening to some uh, parts of the world, like uh, the Tuvalu Island that is disappearing uh, because of the increase in the uh, water level of uh, the oceans. Uh, uh, I invite you to read more about it. Florida would be underwater. And in fact, people who live in Florida uh, feel already the effect. Uh, the rising sea levels are associated with what's called king tides. And this is Fort Lauderdale in Florida. In 2013, you could see that the water has uh, invaded uh, the uh, coastal areas of uh, uh, the city. As I suggested, uh, we should expect uh, an increase in the weather phenomena. Uh, uh, the city of uh, uh, Paradise uh, uh, in 2019 was all burned to the ground, all the residences there, and that's because of the uh, effect of the effect of warming on, as I suggested, uh, increase in the weather phenomena, uh, the heat fluxes on the Earth's surface. Uh, what uh, can be very troublesome is a possible 
a fast release or melting of the permafrost. The permafrost in uh, northern parts of the continents uh, can release as it decays more carbon dioxide and uh, more uh, methane gas as it decays into the atmosphere and it becomes some kind of a, uh, a positive feedback uh, effect. So if the frost, uh, the permafrost is thawed uh, as another weather phenomena, uh, methane, the permafrost basically is methane, uh, hydrates uh, also at the bottom of the oceans could be released. And that can explain in the graphs that I generated from the uh, uh, Vostok uh, data, uh, how is it that uh, the temperature would increase in a very, very fast effect? So there is uh, definitely over the 100,000 year cycle, there is a positive heat back, uh, feedback effect that once the process starts, it can move quite very fast uh, uh, in general. Uh, of course, uh, climatic change is uh, uh, leading to disruptions in different parts of the world. The cyclones have changed their paths. So it is not going to be the same world we are living in today if uh, we allow the global warming to continue uh, unchecked. And this is the simple conclusion that we can reach there. And, that, and uh, this is, uh, uh, again, it shows us a circum global uh, equatorial current. It is stuck at the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, if we do not reconnect the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, nature will do it to, for us. We, uh, nature likes stability and uh, it is, uh, however, in the process, lots of disruptions are going uh, to happen. Uh, some people suggest that uh, it's really the solar activity cycle and they try to predict it to 2040. And up to 2040, they suggest that uh, uh, we are going to get into a cool period. And they say, oh, well, we must have some more <laughs> global warming. Uh, there is uh, some people also who came up with suggestions about long-term cycles of cooling and uh, heating. And uh, here they suggest that we are getting into uh, a heating cycle without intervention uh, from uh, the anthropogenic or the uh, human production of carbon in general. Definitely, we are living in a period of social dislocations. This is a, uh, uh, an award-winning picture of a migrant boat. Look at all those people there uh, crowded in a boat uh, trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. Hundreds of them, uh, men, women, and their families, children have been, uh, of course, uh, have drowned in the process. So the uh, global climatic change is already affecting us. Uh, these are lines of migrants uh, 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 displaced uh, through uh, uh, droughts in the Middle East, uh, North Africa, uh, seeking refuge in Europe. Uh, because once the drought started, different denominations started fighting each other and uh, civil war and look at uh, the hapless uh, situation there uh, in the United States on the south border. It's a sobering uh, show to see those people trying to uh, cross into the United States, escaping droughts in the uh, Southern American uh, states in general. Some people have dreams about uh, creating uh, uh, basically uh, uh, lily pads in the ocean to, and this is uh, very far-fetched. The best thing to do is to uh, stop the damage that uh, as humans, we are uh, causing to humanity in general. Uh, an interesting topic that uh, I'd like to bring to your attention very quickly uh, is a possibility of, uh, uh, if you reconnect, as I suggested, the uh, uh, Atlantic to Pacific Oceans through nuclear kind of excavation, uh, you will find that uh, you can have a, a potential drop. And I show you how to can calculate the energy that can be produced, tremendous amount of energy uh, between the different evaporation rates of the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific uh, Ocean uh, uh, in general. And uh, this is a picture satellite photograph of the Isthmus of, Pan Isthmus of Panama, that's Lake Gatun here. Uh, this is the only 37 uh, miles of, uh, uh, of uh, a canal. We have much longer canal, the Suez Canal in Egypt, for instance, are examples. Uh, I'm not going to stop sharing here. I'll invite you uh, to read uh, 
uh, a research paper and write me a one or two paragraph uh, uh, kind of summary of it and uh, where I suggested this idea. And uh, I hope that some of you would uh, carry on the idea and explore it uh, further. And uh, the title, as you could see here, Restoring the Global Equatorial Current uh, Using uh, Nuclear Excavation. And uh, it was published uh, as far back as 2009, but the idea is still there in case we fail in our effects in uh, uh, reducing carbon uh, emissions and we get a runaway uh, type of uh, uh, a global uh, warming. So uh, that idea needs to be improved on, uh, but uh, the interesting aspect is that nuclear energy can help us save the stupidity of humans of uh, affecting our climate in a deleterious uh, way. I'll ask you to read that uh, uh, article and summarize it in one to two paragraphs. And uh, at that point, uh, that's the end of our course. Uh, I'll still uh, remain in the chat room in general.